What's up, YouTube, ham radio operators, GMRS operators, and people who just genuinely like electronics? K5MOB here. Uh, I've had a couple of people ask, so Sam, how do you connect an MSR 2000 or an MSR 5000 amplifier to a exciter other than what originally came in, in it whenever it was built by Motorola? So, uh, what I'm going to do today is, is walk you through and show you how to, uh, the connections you got to make up, um, voltage regulation, uh, the, the amplifier requires a 9 volt input to actually turn on the bias inside the amplifier. And uh, there's a third wire that's in there that was previously used as a feedback loop going into the exciter to uh, reduce the exciter power if the amplifier was in an overheat condition. So uh, what I have is an MSR2000 repeater it's a UHF band it uh, previously was crystal controlled and I am personally going to be exciting it with some Motorola max track units uh, but we'll go ahead I'll explain the, the setup that I have here and how to identify the the lines for proper connection so <clears throat> this is the basic MSR 2000 chassis I've pulled all of the original Motorola uh, repeater and re or the Motorola transmitter and receiver out of it I have the Motorola duplexers in the bottom of it. Uh, Bofung radio hooked up to the input of it. And a <clears throat> SWR power meter combination and a <clears throat> dummy load connected to it. So on the amplifier, you're going to have a couple of connections. I'll go ahead and flip this down. There's a little connector on the back of here that's uh, coming out of the amplifier. And uh, this particular amplifier is a Tango Lima Echo 2283 Bravo. Now you could have an 83 Bravo or you can have an uh, 83 Alpha. Both of them are, are identical to what we're going to do here. Um, those three lines are coming out right here on the bottom. Now you're going to have to identify these lines. As you can see, it was gray coming out the back of the amplifier and it's, it's kind of black right here. It, you know... I've seen a couple of different colors on these. I don't know if that's if somebody repaired them over time or if Motorola actually just used different color wires. So it's always good to identify these before you hook something up and uh, release the magic blue smoke. So what we're gonna do first and foremost is, is identify the ground. So with a, a digital multimeter on uh, continuity test, we're gonna, gonna tap our leads together, be sure we get a beep. All right, so you're going to go from the, the ground of the amplifier, and you can just, on the output uh, here, you can just use that as a ground, and you can go through your wires. Our logic tells us black is normally ground, so we've identified our ground. Now, these other two wires, one of these is going to be the what used to go to the bi-directional feedback loop, and the other one is going to be what is a, a 9-volt input that actually triggers the, the amplifier to start biasing itself. We're gonna put our meter back on DC voltage. We'll get on the ground that we just verified and uh, we're gonna check these lines. So this one is three volts. I know from working on these that whenever you see three, I, actually it can be anywhere from about just above zero to three volts, this line will, will uh, show sometimes that is the nine volt input that is we put nine volts to this line right here and it it starts biasing the amplifier so you can transmit the other line is going to show 15 some some of them is as high as 16 volts um that's directly proportional to what the the input voltage of your or your amplifier is if you only got 14 volts coming in then it's only going to show 14 volts um this is the the formally whenever it was used in Motorola service this would go back into the transmitter into the exciter and the hotter the amplifier gets the lower the voltage gets on here and um, that's just to keep the the amplifier from going thermonuclear and self-destruct if, if somebody hot keys the system so that's pretty much the easiest way to do this and check it Another thing you can do is on the inside of here, those wires go back to that Molex plug and they come up to this three pin plug up here. So these are pins one, two, and three from right to left. 
all right? Pin one is your nine volt input. Pin two is your ground. And pin three is your line that's going back for the bi-directional coupler inside of the exciter that uh, reduces the exciter drive. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and hook up the meter to the output lines so we can see that voltage drop as we run this amplifier because I'm gonna I'm run this unit hopefully long enough to be able to, to get it to go into an overheat condition. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> if you're using the original Motorola chassis on this, Motorola was so kind to give us a 9 volt output. If you're not using the original <clears throat> Motorola chassis, you're going to have to source 9 volts. And I'll, I'll draw a schematic with a voltage regulator to show you how to source that 9 volts. So this is the output on that orange wire down there. It's coming from the back of the PA, back of the power supply in, inside this cabinet. And I'm just going to hook that up so we start biasing that amplifier. This amplifier is designed for 300 milliwatts of input RF. Um, this Bofeng was one that we purchased. There's no modifications to it. Just happens to put out about 500 milliwatts on low. It's actually a little bit lower than, than the rest of them that's made, but it's, it's great for, for testing this. So this amplifier was originally designed to, to operate on 451 megahertz, and um, I'm actually going to go down to 444-800 just to show you that it operates in the hand band. Now while we're doing this, I'm going to keep track of the temperature of the amplifier. So as per the Motorola service manual, whenever you're going to tune one of these amplifiers, there's, there's two potentiometers on the lower right-hand side of this board. You're going to be sure both of these are turned all the way clockwise. And then the third potentiometer is a little green one. It's labeled R911. You're going to turn that potentiometer all the way counterclockwise. What this is going to do is, is reduce the output of the transmitter well, actually when I key it up we're gonna see zero zero watts output on the the watt meter so I'm gonna go ahead and key the transmitter now zero output watts and I'm gonna turn this up this is a hundred watt deck I'll go ahead and turn it wide open you can see the meter there it only goes up to about a hundred watts some of these things actually do a hundred and thirty watts out I'm gonna tune this back down to 50 watts because the amplifier was originally designed to be intermittent duty so generally we try to reduce it by 50 percent whenever we're moving them over to hand band um, as you can see the output of that that 15 volts is now down to 13.93 i'm going to start a timer and we'll see how hot she gets now as i'm as i'm doing this i'm going to have to to drop this radio i think i got a two minute timeout timer on it and uh, we'll just we'll rekey it and we'll see see how hot she gets. I do this to every amplifier that we convert from commercial duty over. I want to be sure that I can I can key it for you know a, a while without it overheating. So we're at a, we're at 122 degrees right now on the on the PA deck and uh, 13 volts on the feedback loop We're bouncing back and forth between 115 and 116 on the PA and we're still at 14 volts on the feedback loop I'm going to I'm going to cut this one if we if we make it all the way to the 3 minute mark which is most of the most ham repeaters is actually an FCC requirement that you have a a, a 3 minute timeout timer. So I'm going to I'm going to cut this one at 3 minutes if we if we make it there with uh without overheating and without it telling the former exciter that it needs to shut off. Um I mean to be honest, I run these things for 
30 to 45 minutes normally and uh, I'll, I'll key it with the service monitor and just let it just let it sit there and uh, and be sure that we can run it at, at 50 watts output without overheating anything before we put them in the ham duty so we're at 117 118 degrees Fahrenheit and we're still at 14.11 volts on that that feedback loop and you'll know you'll know pretty quick um i did one of these uh, a, a few months ago and uh I, I was only able to get 30 watts out of it at a, at a, and within seven minutes it, it was up to 130 degrees 135 degrees bouncing around so we're we're still at 119 and we're still at uh 14.14 voltage on the feedback and we're almost at three minutes uh, we just went up to 121 and we're 14.5 volts so we're we're over the three minute mark there and uh, any repeater controller that's set up properly would have uh, dropped this deck out We're about three and a half minutes and we're still still at 121. All right, so now you know how to key it with an external exciter. What happens if you don't have nine volts to energize that line? This is pretty easy to do. There's a voltage regulator and it's a 78 series voltage regulator. So 78 is always gonna be your first number. If you need nine volts, it's going to be a 7809. Um, there's several voltage regulators in this range. Um, the two that I use the most is a 7809 and a 7805. 09 is going to give you nine volts. 05 is going to give you five volts. This is a really, really simple circuit to build. It's a three pin. It's a three pin voltage regulator. All right. This is going to be 12 volts in. This is going to be your ground reference. Make that look like a zero instead of a six. All right, this is going to be your nine volts out. This is going to be your ground reference. So you just put three capacitors in here. This is, this is really simple. All of these capacitors can be the same value. 100 nanofarads make a proper schematic and draw the tie-ins This side of this 12 volts, you're going to want to source this off of a cost, off of a core, or if you have a repeater controller that actually, you know, has an amplifier trigger on it, you're going to want to source this from, from a place like that. You only want to turn the bias on, on the amplifier, when the repeater actually needs to transmit. I mean, anybody that's been around RF knows an amplifier sitting there just biasing with no no carrier and no intelligence um, you have the possibility of all kind of inner mod and you're probably gonna piss everybody off at the site that you're on um, so you know just be sure to trigger this with cost or core pin one is your is your voltage in pin two is a ground reference pin three is your output voltage put these caps in there like I said 100 100 nanofarads will, will, will work perfectly fine and uh, always bring it to pin one inside of here and uh that ought to get you running i always check these things please by 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 no means should you install one of these and just hook it up and crank it wide open you're gonna smoke the pa deck um you always want to run it in some type of duty test hook it up to a really good dummy load uh we shot a video actually previous to this one and i hooked it up to the smaller dummy load and uh 
got the got the dummy load smoking hot within about three minutes so um other than that if you have any questions post them in the comments below i'll try to get to them happy hamming happy gmrs and happy electronics k5 mob signing off